I'm now excited to be joined by a very special guest. It is the concierge, the mayor of Lexington, Tom Hart. Uh, Tom, how many SEC towns are you still paying for meals and drinks? Oh, Connor, that's a that's a fantastic question. Um, very few, very few. Usually the red carpet is rolled out, flower petals at my feet, um, the finest meats and cheeses across the land. You're talking about somebody who did literally live in and pay taxes in. Well, actually, I pay taxes in all of them now. Um, but three SEC towns, really. I mean, Columbia, Missouri, I grew up. Uh, my first job was in Columbia, South Carolina. And then I feel like now being a resident of Atlanta, we can certainly count Atlanta as an SEC town, if not a suburb of Athens. So I've I've got it all covered, west to east. Do you still pay for drinks in, in Austin and Norman? Um, something I'm working on. Yeah. Yeah. We've got a summer to figure that out, but, um, it's coming. It's it'll, coming. It'll thanks, for put, some... thanks for putting more work on my plate. You know, just hey, do, do what I can. I'm, I'm trying to make sure that you're not, you know, getting lazy or anything like that with your ability to, to schmooze or anything, but no, seriously, like if there is someone who has seen this, this conference far and wide, it, it is obviously you. Um, more importantly, what happened with your tire? Because you never gave the people an update after oh. posting the picture of what looked like someone taking a machete to your tire. Hey, Connor, here's the thing. I'm cheap. I'm cheap. And and I would never do this with, say, my daughter's car. Um, and my wife's been driving my car. So I've been – I've assumed the role of driving my wife's car in the, the random times that I am in town. And she needed two new tires. And I said, hold on. Why would I go spend hundreds of dollars on a t on two tires when we're going to trade this car in at some point this summer and get a new car? Let's just let's just get through it. And um, she said, "Well, the the air pressure is going down." I said, I'll, "I'll go refill the tires." Well, the service station that I go to to refill the tires on my own, I don't pull in and use full service. I pull up, wave to the guy, grab the hose. It doesn't have a PSI indicator, right? What? So the only yeah, so you just kind of have to eyeball it. And then if you get back in the car and you can, you can check or run the numbers, or if it doesn't yell at you, you go, okay, it's, it's full now. Um, so by all indications, what happened was, um, there's maybe some tire rot on the inside of one of the tires. It's old tire, needs to be replaced. I get that. Um, I, I was done driving for the day. The car was just sitting outside the house for like two hours. Um, I was told by someone who would know that the tire rot, plus perhaps, I'm not saying it's my fault, perhaps overinflation mm -hmm. and the rising temperature outside caused the tire to expand and then kablooey. I mean, it sounded like a transformer blew. It was so loud, I'm not kidding you, that neighbors, this one, that one, that one, that one, four different neighbors, five, including my family, we all came out to the cul-de-sac and looked around like, did, did Connor O'Gara just drop an M80 in the sewer? Like, what What was that loud bang? And we didn't discover the tire until the next day. So that's your long answer. Not having the PSI on the, when you're filling up the tire, that should be illegal. That That's just wrong. Like, I was doing it this morning on our car because, you know, you get the, the light that comes up. And you're like, all right, I'm going to make sure that we're good on each one. You're going through and you're checking it. I'm like, if I didn't have that PSI reading, I would overinflate it every single time. Aren't you more inclined to overinflate than underinflate? The last thing you yeah. want to have to do is go back to that service station, get your hands dirty from rolling that hose back up and putting it back on the holder. Like you, nobody wants to do that more often than they have to. So we're willing to do it. Just give me a measuring stick. I, I'm going to go over every single time just for convenience sake and until a tire blows up. Okay, of any SEC coach, current or former, who would most likely either overinflate your tires or slash your tires, and why would it be Jimbo Fisher? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, I, I don't know that any of them would actually inflate the tire, but given the opportunity, with a yeah, there could be a walk-by stabbing. Yeah, there could mm -hmm. be just a whoosh, or maybe just, you know, key the side of it. That could happen. What, have you talked to Jimbo? What did he say? Why is, what, what happened? 
Ah, uh, I just, you know, just, just picking up, you know, reading the tea leaves a little bit, just a certain, you know, production meeting that gets missed and, you know, just no love lost. I think there are certain coaches that, you know, they get a mulligan and then there are other coaches who, uh, who don't. And Jimbo wasn't getting a mulligan in that spot from you. So, yeah, he'd used his mulligans, number one. The mulligans hmm. were used up. Number two, very little bothers me in these scenarios. I mean, I've had coaches um, in different sports say, hey, I know we're supposed to meet or we have scheduled to meet. I, I got a thousand things going on. I'm sorry. Can I get a pass? Yeah, bro. It, you, it's not killing me, right? I, I'm getting information about your program, not the other way around. So if you don't have time, I don't want to force you in it. It's not a hostage situation. Um, but I have a partner who played for him. He was his offensive coordinator at Auburn. And seeing that he was hurt, and that he thought there should be more loyalty in that scenario, that's what ticked me off. Like, I get it. You owe no loyalty to me. Um, but th there's also a bit of this partnership. You know, it can be a dance in what we do. And I think um, I think I would like it if some, some coaches completely get this. Some athletic directors absolutely do this. Sports information directors 110% get this. There are times where, as a partner – you do a favor in maybe how a story is presented, um, whether or not a story is emphasized or de-emphasized based on a professional relationship that is, hey, we'd rather you guys not talk about X or, um, you know, could, could you spend less time on Y than you normally would? And I'm happy to do that given the situation, right? If you, if you can uphold other ethics and standards, but if you don't rep, if you don't recognize that we've done that for you in the past, then what's the purpose here? You know, like wh where's the quid pro quo? I don't really know what that phrase means, but I I it either. may fit here. Um, th so that that part can be irksome, I suppose. I know that, like, you know, it gets overblown a little bit sometimes of, you know, these coaches in a production meeting. Everybody thinks that they act a, a certain way. I would love to sit on sit in on you and, and Cole and Jordan in a production meeting with Saban. I, at that to me, I would have just been waiting for the moment where, and you're, you're good at this. So you wouldn't actually do this, but I would just tell myself that could happen where you would make a joke in that setting that Saban would just not acknowledge whatsoever. That's had to have happened to you at least once. Oh, without a doubt. And um, you, it's like any good story that you have in your pocket for a broadcast. There's certain games where you want to tell a story or a nugget or a stat, and it just doesn't fit in the game, right? Uh, Connor's been red hot from three. I've got this nugget that shows that this is in the 99th percentile, and as soon as he makes a three, I'm going to break it out. And then Connor turns his ankle, and he doesn't shoot any threes. Well, I can't, I can't do it. Um, I did. You remember the D's nuts joke with Saban probably like three years ago? One of his freshmen shared that he said that. I think it was two years ago um, that he says D's nuts jokes all the time in practice. So I really him. wanted to drop one on him to start the meeting. Like it was going to be right off the – here we go. And I, a teenage son who every time I got in the car pickup line had a slew of them waiting for me. So I had like – not literally, but I had a notebook full of these nuts jokes. And I was getting – that was going to be like right off the bat. Hey, Coach, how we doing? Boom! But then he walked in and he was a little sullen and shuffling his feet. And so, uh, okay, we, we can't do this. I, I did tell him at the end of the meeting, you know, my teenage son does not watch much college football, but you're his favorite coach. And he kind of perked up and he goes, oh, yeah? Yeah, because of these nuts. And I felt like that was – that was worth sharing. They're human beings, Connor. They put their capes on one thing at a time, just like the rest of us. Counterpoint, he was having a rough day. He needed a D's nuts joke to be able True. to all of a sudden put a smile on his face. It was Dolly Parton who once said, if someone doesn't have a smile, give one of yours to them. That could have been you on that day. Is that what Dolly said? I, that's, that's, I believe, I believe I sold that from Dolly. I'm going to, I'm going to make that my own. I don't think anybody is, is going to push back on that though. She's an American treasure. Uh, there is a bit of pressure though, when you have a production meeting with, with Nick Saban and I, I was guilty probably the first couple in that um, I would share something to try and get his opinion on it. 
when really all he wanted to do was talk ball. Totally fine. You like trial and error, right? But imagine him sitting there with a, a styrofoam coffee cup. And as I'm relaying the story, and I have to give a little bit of background before I get his opinion, he's holding the cup to his lips. <laughs> YouTube audience, Tom is taking, or uh, the oh, audio sorry. in the audience, Tom is taking his nice cup you know, that, that you could see in, in, you know, in the video here and taking a nice slow sip and just giving the death stare. And all you get is the eyes over the yeah. brim of the cup. And, and the more I spoke, the narrower those eyes got. So finally, when I, when I finished the background of the story before I can ask a question, I was like, well, this is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. So I pulled the ripcord, asked it as quickly and conveniently as I could at that point. Um, that's on one end of the spec spectrum. The other end is, you know, we've had meetings with them before where we start talking ball and with Josh Maxson, his sports information director, standing behind us, pointing at his watch, and Saban's at the dry erase board drawing up plays. I'm like, well, no, no, he's not leaving. We're certainly not wrapping this meeting. We are getting a, basically a one-on-one -on -one from the greatest coach to ever do it. Why would you rush him out of this room? Um, th those, those are the ones you really uh, choose to remember. Sometimes I think about that. Of like, imagine telling Saban that and thinking you're going to be able to to impact what he's going to do, or imagine being that person that put up the message to Jimmy V before his all time speech, being like, "Hey, you've got 30 seconds." Like, imagine being in that spot and how much shame you feel for the rest of time. Just like it's it's humbling, but people like that, you know, they make the world go round. I guess they need to exist in some sort of capacity. The train uh, the trains have to run on time. They do. You know what? If they don't, then the train system falls apart. Actually, that's exactly what happened. That is literally <laughs> what happened in America. No more trains. Um, when I shadowed you guys a few years ago, I, I was blown away at the production meeting that you guys had. I, I didn't sit in on the, the, the players and coaches production meeting, but the, the TV production meeting that you guys had with the crew, you know, the day before the game, because for those who don't know, like the attention to detail, the ideas that get suggested, the knowledge that's on display, I think I have a pretty good grasp on football, just as, as someone that is, watches a lot of it and does this for, for a living. And then I hear Jordan and Cole talk about it. And I'm like, yeah, I, I know nothing. I know, I know absolutely nothing. How many points, at least in terms of football IQ, have they added to you based on like these seven seasons that you've had with them? Well, here's where I point out that we're the only broadcast crew in college football where all three of us actually played college football. Yep. Stop the oh. tape. I don't want to add that I was like a non-scholarship division three, you know, skinny tight end slash slow wide receiver hybrid. Um, but I got a helmet around here somewhere that would prove it or at least hybrid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> hybrid. Yeah. Um, no, a ton, a ton. And w what we did right off the bat when we became a crew and this is actually pre Jordan, when Cole was going to be on the field and we, we had a field analyst, the first person I called was, Sean McDonough. And um, I said, how do you work with a field analyst? Like, what is the traffic like? What do you, what needs to happen? Forget about chemistry and all that stuff. Um, that's, that goes without saying. And he said, well, the first thing you have to do, because I, I think at that point he had McShay and uh, Blackledge was, was McDonough's crew at the time. He said, you need to watch film together because what happens is one guy may watch, um, Say, for example, last week's game, and the left tackle is terrible. And the other guy watched week one, three, and five, and the left tackle was fantastic. And then all of a sudden they get in the game, and one guy loves the left tackle, and the other guy hates the left tackle, and they haven't had that discussion yet. And so they, they, can't, they can't come to a reasonable conclusion and have a fair conversation about it. Um, so what we started doing, that was with, with Andre Ware, is we'd go in and watch film together. And Andre, from the quarterback perspective, taught us – so much, you know, like, okay, well, here's how you can read man zone based on that one corner and his hips. Um, and Cole would talk about the line play um, and where they should or shouldn't be in different protections. But they knew what the other guy was talking about. And for me to observe that, I knew what got their motor going. I knew what Andre liked. I knew what he didn't like. I knew which calls he liked. I knew which calls he hated. And by the way, Salty Andre Ware is the best analyst ever. Like, he, the guy won a Heisman. He knows what offense is supposed to look like. 
but he's usually just kind of so chill that he doesn't get riled up. If you show him a bad offense or bad play calls, he gets mad. He just comes with a hammer. So I learned that if I could get the salty Andre, we'd be going the right direction. Um, so yeah, those guys breaking down film when you can sit and watch games together or Saturday at noon or whenever Jordan's flight lands, we go grab lunch and, you know, grab a sandwich and watch that early afternoon game. Not only do I learn more football, but I learn what makes them tick and what they're passionate about, not just big picture, but what matters to them that game. And I think that's a place that it's, it's my job to get them to. Okay. So stay with me on this one. Okay. When I first got, when I first got to know you, I was like, all right, we, we, we kind of hit it off from the jump, you know, got along very well. Um, similar sense of humor. I'd like to hold think. on. Can and- I, may I interrupt? <laughs> on our first podcast, you asked that I, I agreed to come on at SEC Media Day. Uh, you guys asked me what kind of underwear I wore. First of all, first and, of and all. I answered the question. I'm not saying it was outrageous. I mean, that's that's kind of where we jumped off into the deep end. If I if I recall correctly, that was definitely a Marler question. I know that's 100 percent a Marler question. Second of all, I think we also asked you something about your jail habits of what they would be. I think, no, it was, you said you had just gotten out of jail that night or that that previous night and that you had, you know, found your way into SEC media days. So what type of underwear you wore in jail, I think, were the primary topic of com- topics of conversation the first time we met. Give the people what they want. I, I apologize. I interrupted yeah. your, your no, intro. No, no. It's, it's important context. It's, it's very much needed. Cole, I remember thinking like, well, Cole, maybe he just dislikes everyone. And then, you know, you get to know Cole and he, you know, he opens up and and you you realize that there is someone with a a giant heart and, you know, somebody that is extremely knowledgeable uh, about this sport. This is going to sound bad. Jordan is my Julia Roberts. And here's what I actually, you know what? Here's a better way to, to ask this. Do you know where in the world I would make that connection and why I would say Jordan Rogers is my Julia Roberts and it is not based on their initials. Yeah. I think you're, you're, you're drawing that um, based on the fact that you you've got Lyle Lovett's beard going right now and you, you fancy yourself a crooner. And if you just find the right tune, then you're going to outkick your coverage and she slash he is going to come running to you and say, let's be wed. But you haven't found that right tune yet, I suppose. Okay, close, but kind of not really. But kind of not really. <laughs> okay, so I'm watching Aaron Brock. Nobody knows kid. who Lyle Lovett is, by the way. Like, that is so out of left field. That was right over my head. Right over my head. Had no idea. Was just going to take the compliment. I assume Lyle Lovett is a, a, a well-bearded human being. Lyle Lovett is a great country singer, but he's maybe one of the ugliest men in showbiz history. And he married Julia Roberts. Like That's it right. made zero sense that they would make a couple, but they were married for some time. I don't know how long. Okay, right, that makes continue. sense. That's that's good. I like that. Um, I'm stealing that. That's mine now. Uh, the the 180 that I have done on Julia Roberts came full circle when I'm watching Aaron Brockovich the other night. I had had an opinion of Julia Roberts my entire life because I just kind of missed when she was at her peak, and so you kind of have a certain impression of a celebrity and you're like, this person's so wildly overrated. And over the course of the last three years, I have gone from saying that woman is a homewrecker to being like, she is one of the best actors of our generation. And Aaron Brockovich fully cemented that for me and how good that movie is seeing it for the first time. Jordan was the person that I watched the very first time he came on a television screen. And it was the bachelorette, of course. And the impression that I had of Jordan early on was that of entitlement. And, you know, I obviously had very biased feelings about his brother, still kind of do. And you have these certain impressions of who he is. And then you get to know him. And then the more you actually watch what he does and you listen to him. And I think it was, you know, after we had him on the first time, you're like, all right, this guy's a really good dude. But then, you know, you're kind of like, what does he know about football as much? And then the more you listen to him and then he did his breakdowns during 2020, during COVID. Where they're in, where they're in like Puerto Rico or wherever, he's doing these breakdowns from on his screen, and I'm like, holy crap! I am so unbelievably wrong, and I have done everything in my power the last three and a half years to admit how wrong I was about Jordan. Do people still not realize how good Jordan is? Well, that's a, yeah, I don't know. I don't. I don't have a great temperature for what people think of his 
football work uh, um, when it's negative. I mean, um, we see the the trolls every t- every game, right? They come out regardless. Uh, but I think generally they're receptive. Uh, just maybe not my tale to tell, but I will tell it anyway. Um, I think there were some coaches who have come around in a big way, and those that didn't kind of got the lesson taught to them. And a quick example was those – some of those breakdowns. Uh, he did a Bo Nix breakdown when he was at Auburn that was, um, I guess, from some perspectives, just scathing when it was the hard truths of what Bo Nix was doing wrong in terms of leaving the pocket early, for example, what the coaching staff was doing wrong with him, not giving him the opportunity to check at the line of scrimmage from a losing play into a winning play, and some other details that surrounded that. And when we got on – um, our coach's call, which was a Zoom at the time with the then Auburn staff, they just wanted to maul him. Um, but what he did was kind of like he earned Brockovich them, at least Chad Morris in one way or another, in that he said, listen, yell at me all you want. Tell me where I'm wrong. I'm totally fine with it. I didn't I didn't name any names. You know, I, I'm just going through the film and seeing what I see. And then every detail that Jordan mentioned in that breakdown – he asked, okay, well, um, have you guys been working with them leaving the pocket too early? Oh, yeah, we sure have, man. He, he leaves the pocket way too early and too often. Okay. Um, do, do you guys give him the opportunity, freedom to check at the line of scrimmage? If he comes to the line, they're stacked in the A gap, and that's where the play is going? Well, no. We control that from the sideline. Okay. Like, you've answered the questions. And those are just two <laughs> examples. Um, but, no, he – what you're saying is the thing, same thing that that coaching staff realized. He does his homework. He works at it. He knows it. Um, I think what viewers love about it is he, if you just listen to him, um, and maybe you know, maybe there's some sort of facade up where people can't get past the fact, you know, that their wives were watching him on the Bachelorette. Um, he knows he knows ball, and he knows how to explain it in a very easy and friendly manner. There's a lot of people know ball, right? It's just you know, how do we get past hammering me with X's and O's and tell me why the deep ball for Jaden Daniels is going to make him, you know, the first quarterback taken in the draft, just as a random example. Jordan actually told that story at SEC Media Days when we had him on. That exact story that I yeah. had kept quiet for a couple of years but thought it was really, really good and really insightful because that might have actually been the moment where I did my full 180 of like, oh, my God, I was wrong about him from a football acumen standpoint. And totally got it. Um, so like you say, like he's like Aaron Brockovich. So if I just start calling him Aaron now, that's perfectly fine, right? Might be. Okay. Aaron might with be an E. Confusing. Aaron yeah. with an E. Not Aaron with <laughs> yeah. Yeah. two A's. Yeah. We I get it. Yeah, we wouldn't do that. All right. You want to close with uh with some Mizzou talk? You wanna you wanna talk about the 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 team that you grew up watching that yeah. like, had some moments during the 14 playoff era in which you had to wonder. Huh, is this going to be it? And last year, I feel like it just changes a lot of what one thinks of of this program, what one thinks of drink, and the ability to be able to do this, obviously, multiple years in a row is everything. What's a fair expectation for Mizzou? Is it 12-team playoff? I think it's fair. Yeah, it's totally fair. I mean, can you replicate what you did last year? Well, um, you've got to find a productive running back, but – you know, you found one off of a scrap heap the year prior. So is that too big an expectation? Um, you've got to get great quarterback play once again. Well, this guy's healthy for the second season in a row and another season in the system. Um, I, I think to me, Missouri has the opportunity, if they're able to replicate last year, uh, which I think they can, um, they have an opportunity not just to be a trendsetter within the history of the, its own program, but also a trendsetter throughout all of college football. And, and this is where I'm going. In this day and age where this landscape continues to shift, and we don't know who's going to be maybe left out in 10 years or 12 years or 20 years or five years, uh, Missouri's fought for its place at the table. And they have said, listen, you don't have to be Alabama or LSU to demand a seat at the table. But you got to win now, and you've got to invest in the sport to show people that you're willing to win now and you have everything it takes to win now. Um, would Missouri have been as appealing to the SEC if they hadn't reached number one and been just just that close to playing for a national title in 2007? You know, 
Maybe, maybe not. Maybe it was all about TV households. Or maybe the decision maker saw it and said, okay, listen, if we can get that version of Missouri every once in a while, then they're going to strengthen the league. Um, and I think that's a great example for every like-minded institution of similar size, whether that's, you know, Purdue or even Mississippi State or Arizona, wherever you are, no longer is the excuse, well, pfft, you see who we have to play? I mean, I was at uh, like three weeks after uh, third week of January. Let's put it that way. I went to Costco, you know, because that's what I do. I buy things in bulk and I'm wearing a Mizzou hoodie. And on my way out, the guy who checks the receipt draws a little line and, like, looks at that cart and laughs at how much you uh, spent. Says something to me about Ohio State. He's, he's a Buckeye fan. And I turned to him and I said, sir, you've made my day. Because never before <laughs> have I thought that an Ohio State Buckeye football fan would attempt to talk trash to a Missouri football fan. But that's where we are because we beat your faces in in Jerry World. So it's a good place to be. The game that you were calling, I thought that was the turning point for Mizzou. Everybody's going to want to point to, you know, the Mevis kick against Kansas State, which I, I totally get, and it's this big, dramatic moment. But, like, being on the road in Lexington, a place that w when it gets going, like, it, it, it get very loud there. And Kentucky fans were kind of feeling like this was their exhale moment against Mizzou, and, oh, finally, you know, after kind of a weird start, herky-jerky start, they're going to be able to kind of right the ship. And instead, Mizzou just goes on this rampage and storms back and wins that game that – in no year of Mizzou recent memory do they even win that game, much less win that game by a wide margin. Why did that game feel so significant for the trajectory of Mizzou? Well, kind of going back to what we were talking about a moment ago, that th there are more teams like Missouri in terms of funding and um, their place in the, in the big college football world. There are more Missouris and Kentuckys than there are Alabamas and Georgias, right? And so uh, Kentucky has been a great barometer. That, that game has meant a lot in terms of how each team has ended its season since really since Missouri's, I, I guess really since Stoops got to Kentucky, you know, like in Missouri was in the league like that. They're built similarly in many ways. So to be able to pull that off against Kentucky when you're down 14, nothing, you fake a punt, your guy throws it on the money right outside of the end zone. And, Cold, rainy night. It, it's one of those games that you would never want to suggest because um, it it sounds insulting because it is. But you never want to in, uh, suggest that a team would quit. Teams quit all the time. Individuals quit. Teams quit. The the just the aura of we're on the road. We're down. Here goes everything. It's been flushed down the toilet. It happens a lot. And, and fans don't want to hear that because they may be invested into the very final play, but reality is that happened. So they were down. Uh, we, I think we went to break. Like if we have the audio of us going to break, you know, we probably even said, well, this game's over. Like what, what are we going to talk about for the next three quarters? Um, and then they came back and they ran the fake punt. So I think it was, I think you're right. I think pointing to that game was a big moment in terms of the belief that, Hey, we're good enough to pull this out. We played like crap through the first quarter. They're, they've been better than us, but for four quarters, we're going to be better than them. I think that's a powerful lesson to learn. The Brady Cook-Heisman campaign, if it gets off and running, I don't like just defaulting to his last name. I feel like that's too easy. I feel like we should have to work a little bit harder. That's like too obvious. Can you come up with something by the time you have a Mizzou game at some point, probably in September or something like that, that just – just kind of pop something that we can all get behind is just like let Brady cook. It's like that one's yeah. that's easy. That's been done. Let's come up with something original. Yeah. Uh, we can definitely, we can definitely come up with something. Um, could there be a Brady tie in, you know, Brady, yeah, that, Brady's maybe Brady's bunch, like old kind of going old school, take it back to the eighties. Okay. Um, seventies, right? Seventies was Brady bunch. Yeah. Seven, but uh, after school reruns, uh, and yeah. then there was a baseball bunch with Johnny Bench. There was like anytime you bring in bunch, so it's like that's fun and friendly, and let's have a game of kickball. Like let's uh, we don't have a care in the world. Yeah, I think we could. Yes, to answer your question, we're going to workshop this thing. I've, I've okay. just thrown a couple at the wall. I don't know if it's going to stick, but yeah, we'll come up with something really good. All right, homework has been handed down. Tom, you're the best. We'll do it again soon, man. Thank you so much for having me.